Mark Harmon with the Vallejo Independent Bulletin. We're here today with Vallejo Police Chief Joseph Krines, and we're going to ask some questions and find a little bit about what's going on with the police department. So, uh, Chief, um, one of the big questions that everyone obviously keeps hearing about are the numbers, mm -hmm. um, how many officers we have, and it's, it's obviously not enough. Right. Um, how, how, many, how many officers are we at right now? Uh, 82 sworn officers today. Um, you know, no, obviously numbers don't tell the whole story, right. uh, but they certainly tell a significant story considering that this department at one time had as many as 158 sworn officers uh, sort of at, at the height or the, the peak of our staffing. Um, 82, not nearly enough to do the job that we need to do. Um, you can imagine cutting any organization 45% and you're going to have some significant you know, problems and significant issues. Um, you know, just by way of comparison, you look at the Richmond Police Department, uh, and they're doing some great things over there, but they also happen to have 200 police officers, um, more than twice the amount of police officers you know, that we have today. So obviously, you know, one of the biggest issues for us is, is recruitment and hiring, and that's what we're focused on. Right, so how's that going? It's actually going great. Uh, we've hired uh, about 20 police officers since I've been here uh, in the last 18 months. Uh, we swore in four or five new officers just in the last couple of weeks. We will swear in four or five new officers uh, in the next couple of weeks. And um, that's kind of the track that we're on. I'm hoping that you know, every month or two, if we can swear in another three, four, five officers, uh, we'll keep working up towards um, our authorization, which is now at 110 officers. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you hear a lot of scuttlebutt in the community about, uh, you know, the police department is uh, having trouble recruiting and, and they're, not, they're not stepping forward. Um, I mean, rumor, urban myth, or, or is there any truth to rumor, that? Urban You're myth shaking your head. So. Rumor, urban myth, and no truth to it whatsoever. Okay. I, you know, I, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and I'll say that, first of all, recruiting uh, police officers is a very difficult proposition. Um, it's a long process. It's a detailed process. It's a process that involves oral interviews. It's a process that involves, um, you know, somebody that has to go through a, a polygraph and a background investigation. Um, it goes through a very detailed background in regards to uh, their job history, their work history, their personal history. Right. Uh, I mean, you name it. And so it's it's not like you know we can go out and and hire a regular city employee. Uh, police officers are not regular right. city employees. Um, and uh, you know we're very careful in, in regards to that hiring process and so you know at times it can take weeks and or months uh, in order to to go through that process not only does it take a while to go through the hiring process but it takes a significant amount of time to go through um, the training process once we do hire somebody and you could even back up even before the hiring process whereby um, somebody has to go through the police academy, and that in and of itself is about a six-month process to right. get somebody through the academy. Once they've gone through that academy and we put them through that hiring process, uh, it then takes about another four to six months for us to train them so that they can you know, get ready to be a solo beat officer. It is difficult to recruit police officers for any law enforcement agency, and I think it's become more difficult over the last several years for a lot of different reasons. Um, but but uh, you see every agency that I'm aware of struggles with recruitment, struggles with hiring, um, just to make sure that you're getting the best candidates, that you're getting qualified candidates, and you want to make sure that that time and that effort and that energy and the investment that you're making, you know, is going to stick and um, you're not just going to cycle people through right, um, right. because it's very expensive to go through that process. So it's, it's, it's a difficult endeavor, but um, I think we've seen a lot of success. You know, for those people that say that we're having difficulty hiring, well, I think all I have to do is point back and say we've hired more than 20 police officers mm -hmm. in the last 18 months. And then my next question would be, when in the history of this police department have we ever hired 20 people in 18 months? And the answer right. is never. Um, you know, so we can. But conversely, if we've had a big exodus of, of people leaving, retiring, sure, and, absolutely. and so on. No, we have had a big exodus. In fact, we've had 30 going out the door. Well, you know, while we've had 20 or so coming in the door. When I came on about 18 months ago, we had about 92 sworn staffing. Today, we stand at 82. So we have a deficit of 10 uh, in those 18 months. So even though we've hired, you know, 20 plus. We've lost about 30 or so, um, but that's also just the way it goes by way of attrition that sometimes they, you know, organizations go through certain cycles by way of attrition um, and sometimes it's higher and sometimes lower. You know, the average rate of, of, of turnover for just about any law enforcement, law enforcement agency is going to be about 10% uh, you know, on average. So, you know, if you have, um, you know, 100 police officers, you're going to turn over about 10 or so every year, and that's that's relatively right. normal. We're quite a bit above that, though. Uh, we're about, Yeah, we're definitely above yeah. that. But one of the reasons we're above that is because this was an older law enforcement agency. Right. And I say older in the sense that 
we had a lot of officers, you know, reaching that that age of fifty and fifty one mm-hmm. and fifty two, um, and and coming to that point together. That that hasn't been an extraordinary circumstance for you know this agency in comparison to other agencies because. The, you know the advent of three percent of fifty, or you know, the retirement of three percent of fifty, saw you know sort of a, a a drain of a lot of resources once those officers reached that age, and we're sort of at a stage where we're seeing a lot of the baby boomers have gotten there, um, right? And, uh, and and so we saw that exodus of those folks, you know, in you know between fifty and fifty-five years right. old. I mean that whole three percent of fifty thing is obviously really concerning for for everybody for the whole the whole really all cities in California. Well, for, and for a lot of different right. reasons. Um, you know, I mean, the sustainability of, of you right. know, the pensions related to 3 and 50, the uh, the cultural drain, the brain drain, you know, that that we lose when folks go out at the age of 50. I mean, you've had folks at that point, you know, for 25, 30 years, and, and all of a sudden they're leaving and, and leaving in mass at times, uh, and that creates some significant issues. I mean, case in point, the Vallejo Police Department. In the 18 months since I've been here, I've promoted three captains. We only have two. So one that I've promoted has already since retired, uh, and and the other two are, are relatively new to their position. We have seven lieutenants. I've promoted six of those seven lieutenants. Uh, we have about a dozen or so sergeants, and I've promoted almost every single one of those sergeants since I've been here. So um, you know we've had a significant amount of turnover in the supervisory and the management, the command staff of the police department. It's not a bad thing. It just it is. Right. Um, right. You know, and so we have folks that are transitioning into new positions, uh, and hopefully you know we'll be there for some time. Right. Well, well, how do you do you feel like you have there are enough prospective officers in the pipeline that that you can you can sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel when we're going to reach sort of a stable situation i mean is that because obviously people are really concerned about that the numbers keep going down sure you know there's there's crime there's problems and and there's not enough officers to provide the service and do the do the job I think there are enough in the pipeline. You know, as I mentioned, I just I just hired uh, four or five officers. I'm about to hire four or five more, and I think in the next couple of months we'll hire at, at least that many or more. Uh, you know, our goal our goal by the end of this calendar year is to get you know close to that 110 mark. Um, you know, can we get there? I'm hopeful that we can. Um, you know, anticipating how many retirements we may have throughout the rest of the year, I don't see a lot. There'll be there'll be a few maybe, uh, but not very many. Um, so you know, I, I think we're 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 making some some ground. I think we're gaining some traction. I, I I'm pretty confident that within the next few months we'll at least be back up to 90. So where I was, you know, when I came in 18 months ago, uh, and then you know, I think it's going to get better after that. Right, and you don't you don't hear. Just one of the things that you know people always talk about is that is sort of the stigma attached to Vallejo or the bad juju or the. Uh, you know, between the bankruptcy and other kind of things like that, but is is, is that something that you you hear at all, or? No, you know, I, I think there was a there was a bit of a concern certainly during the time of the bankruptcy and ber- during the uncertainty of, of, of the years of the bankruptcy. But you know, I mean, we've we've come long past that now, and and the city is stabilized in a big way. In fact, you know, the city's at at a point now where it's reaching you know financial stability by way of of sustaining its budget for the first time you know out of bankruptcy, and and, and that's a huge factor. The you know the uncertainty with the with the police contracts you know with the with the right. memorandum of understanding, um, I think right. created and, some and obviously you know you, you guys are your 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 officers they got a five percent cut and a bunch of other things, which was imposed. So mm-hmm. so that obviously I mean. That's not a. That's not a happy situation. I mean, that can't be great for morale. It's not a happy situation. It's not great for morale. Nobody likes to have their pay yeah. and benefits cut. I don't care who you are. Right. I don't care what profession you're in. Nobody likes to have their pay and benefits cut. But it, it, it's kind of been the reality of of this of this economy. It's been the reality of of our most recent recession, um, and and I think that you know that situation simply came to fruition for this organization a little later than it did for a lot of other organizations, and and for and you know for a lot of different reasons. But I think the fact that you know we have a contract in place now, you know, implemented or not, or imposed or not, um, has created a little more stability, particularly in regards to hiring. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more candidates. Uh, you know, and when I say candidates, lateral candidates, candidates from other agencies that are willing to look at us again. Um, and the conditional job offers or, or the positions that I see coming in over these next few months are almost all lateral candidates. Um, 
but all lateral candidates are not a good thing, uh, in my opinion. I think you need a mix. I think you have to have a mix of sort of the new and the old. Um, there, you know, there should be a cross section of the people that we're hiring. There should be a, we should try to do the best that we can to diversify our hiring so that we try to mirror, you know, what our community looks like as best we can. That's not always possible. Yeah, I've noticed you you made a real effort to hire people who either. Uh, are from Vallejo or have roots here and, and, and so on. And that seems to me like a very conscious, obviously, effort on, oh, it's on, been a, on your part. It's been a very conscious effort, uh, not only to hire people who are local, but to hire people uh, who are minority, to hire people, um, you know, that, uh, that don't normally sort of fit into the, you know, the classic mold of police officers. Uh, you know, we, we had had several, you know, women police officers at one time. And at one point that had dropped to as low as two. And now since I've been here, we've hired about another four or five women, and, and my goal is to hire more. Um, you know, but you, you don't necessarily look for the woman, you don't nef- necessarily look for the minority candidate, you're looking for the best candidate, um, but uh, nevertheless with an idea that you want to diver- diversify the organization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So obviously uh, increasing the numbers is, is, is a top priority for you. What, what other things are, are high on the list that, that you want to do in, in Vallejo PD going forward? Well, um, you know, every every day we sort of establish a new set of priorities and, and a new list. But one of the things actually we're doing, which is kind of exciting, citywide, and and this is through the through the city manager's office, is that all of our department heads have, have sat down just in the last few months and sort of created performance plans uh, for for each of our departments. Uh, the performance plan that we have for our department uh, is our well, it lists about ten very significant goals. You know, that we're trying to achieve. Um, one of those goals has to do with technology. When we went through the bankruptcy, um, you know, we, we lost a lot of ground in regards to technology. We weren't keeping up with technology. We weren't keeping up with change. And a lot of it had to do with because of our, our financial constraints. The same issue, you know, is true of our staffing. We're in this situation today because of the, of the financial situation, because of the bankruptcy situation. This organization was cut so deeply that it is going to take years to recover. I don't think, um, you know, I, I realize that people are anxious for hiring, they're anxious for staffing, they're anxious for changes in the organization, but we didn't dismantle the organization overnight. It took five or six or seven years to do that, and it is going to take a long time to recover. So in our performance plan, we looked at our technology, and, and what, I'm, what I'm talking about specifically in technology is that we are completely changing our, our backbone of, of our platform in regards to our records management system, our computer-aided dispatch system. We're putting all new mobile data computers into our patrol cars. For the first time ever, we will have in-car digital cameras uh, in, in all of our patrol vehicles. Um, you're already aware that we have uh, body cameras that our officers mm-hmm. are wearing, and now every one of our officers has been issued one of the body cameras. Uh, we're looking at automated license plate readers. We are looking at um, technology related to fingerprint scanners, the technology that goes into the car where officers will have immediate access to fingerprint scanners to be able to identify uh, individuals uh, out in the field. Uh, you know, We're looking at, at other technology related to automated license plate readers, um, whether they be fixed post um, positions um, or whether they be attached to our vehicles. We're looking at enhancing our surveillance systems in the city, in public areas, as, as well as in secure areas, whether they be our detention areas, whether they be our property and evidence areas, um, or other public areas. And, and of course, one of the projects we're working on relates to our participatory budgeting um, and the enhancement of surveillance cameras. So all of those projects are in the works. Um, I will tell you that um, virtually every single one of those projects will be done by the end of this calendar year, most of them by the end of this fiscal year, by the end of June. Um, so we're making significant progress in that area, but it doesn't just stop there. We, we recognize that we've had a lot of issues related to crime and that we're seeing some uptick, uh, particularly related to violent crime and some related to property crime as well. And so we're employing new um, policing strategies related to crime and looking to ways that we can reduce crime overall. Um, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, things like uh, blighted properties and and some of the things that we used to focus on focus on when we had beat health units, for example. Right. You know, now we're calling it community services, okay. uh, and so we're working with the city attorney's office. Uh, we're we're working with our planning department. We're working with all departments. In fact, quite frankly, all of all the ten goals that we've established for this current calendar year, 
every single one of those goals touches another city department and it's incumbent upon every city department to work cooperatively with the police department and vice versa for us to work with every other department so that we can develop a little synergy and that we can get together and, and mutually solve problems uh, and do it in such a way that we really enhance our efficiency and our effectiveness. So, so it sounds to me in a sense that, um, I mean, speaking quite frankly, that in, in, in the previous administration and the police department, there was a, there was a little bit more of a, um, I guess I would call it a citadel mentality. And it sounds like you're really making a, a big effort to reach out to uh, the community, other departments, and, and, and et cetera. I think, I think in the past we saw somewhat of a silo mentality, uh, you know, related to, to public safety. Um, but I think we've seen, we saw a silo mentality in regards to some of the other, our other departments as well. Yeah. And, and I think we have to move out of that, you know, out of that mold. And I think we, I, I know that we have, I'm confident that we have, and that we have to share resources. I mean, our resources are so limited right. that, you know, we have to share them and we have to share them across the board. Um, but not only sharing resources, but we have to share information because we have to have an understanding of what we do and the way we do it. Um, and, and, and recognizing that it's all interconnected, recognizing that we can all work together to, you know, to solve problems in the best way. Um, and, and I think we're seeing a lot more of that. And, and that is absolutely being led by our city manager. We have an outstanding city manager. He's doing a great job. Um, he has turned this organization around in a very positive way. And, and I think a lot of us are very enthusiastic because of that and, and are willing to, you know, to step up and, and you know, do what it takes to, to really be successful. Okay. I'm going to back you up a little bit because you, you, you covered a lot in, 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 in what you said there. You touched on sure. a lot of different things. No um, we, we talk, you talked about some of the surveillance and things like license plate readers, mm -hmm. automatic license plate readers. Now, uh, maybe you can tell me a little bit about that. I know some people are concerned about, for example, you have these things and they, they what my understanding is that they are able to see a license plate and whenever an officer drives by or is moving around somewhere and there's a license plate, it automatically pulls up the the information sure. and, and the whole the whole deal. And one of the things I've heard from people in the community is they're concerned about how long is how is that information held? Is it confidential? How long is it right. kept? Maybe can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, there's you know there when, once we put the license plate readers in place, um, there are best practices in law enforcement throughout the nation in regards to the retention of information, how long we retain the information, where we retain the information, how the information is retained, who can have access to the information. Um, so all of those things will be outlined in our policies and our procedures and our general orders. Um, and, and I think the public can be assured that you know we, we recognize that there's a sensitivity related to the information that we store. But the reality is, is that if you're out in a public roadway, if you're out in a public space, that is public information, and, and that, that kind of information is being gathered every day you know, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, but the license plate information gives us a law enforcement tool because we can go back and look at particular areas, particularly after a crime has occurred, uh, and determine you know, if there was a vehicle in that area, what the license plate was. Um, but also in real time, it's also tied into our, into our crime-related systems, such as our stolen vehicle system. And as an officer drives by, it'll identify a stolen vehicle immediately, and the officer can take you know, immediate enforcement And it's action. just like it pops up on the screen, and it'll pop the up red light comes on, and it because, says stolen? Absolutely, because it's tied to our database. And in fact, it, it comes up, and it, it blasts at the <laughs> officer and says, this is a stolen vehicle. You can also tie it in you, you, to databases in regards to people that have warrants. Uh, in regards to other criminals or criminal activity, um, you know, when I say known criminals and known criminal activity, um, and it, for example, if we happen to be looking for someone and we know that they're attached to a particular vehicle and we know that they're a suspect in a serious crime, a violent crime, um, you know, that information can be inputted into the system. And if that car happens to drive by or if the license plate reader happens to catch it, the officer will be notified. Um, but you know, sounds very Blade Runner. Yeah, it is kind of Blade yeah. Runner. It is very futuristic, uh, but you know, I think that the technology sort of has to keep it, keep up with the criminal activity. Right. Uh, the criminal activity is always going to be probably a step or two ahead of what we're doing. Um, you know, and so that's just one way to uh, to make sure that we're staying in the game. Right. Talk to me about uh, AB one hundred nine and uh, the release of parolees. What what kind of um, impact that do you think that has had? What have you seen as a result of that? You know, I think statewide we're seeing a little bit of an uptick in crime related to the release of the parolees and the probationers and, and the reduced sentences. Um, you know, we're not happy with the reduced sentences. Mm -hmm. I say we, we in law enforcement are not happy. Uh, we see people serving lesser sentences, lesser time uh, in regards to certain offenses, you know, and whatnot, and people being released earlier than they probably should be. 
we know that a significant you know portion of that population is going to reoffend, and you know the matter is is you know when and where they're going to reoffend. You know, we haven't specifically seen a, a particular uptick in crime related to to the AB 109ers or the you know right. the, the parolees and the probationers, at least that we're aware of. Right. At this and point. it'd probably take you know years to see a trend. It's, it's going to take a little time to see a trend. I think yeah, I don't think it take years per se, but it's mm-hmm. going to take a little time. You know, the center that was opened in Vallejo um, and the center that was opened in Fairfield, to my knowledge, we have not had a single issue, a single incident, a single concern um, or a problem you know related to those centers. And the reality is, is that you know, as we've talked about before, these parolees and probationers, they're here. They're here in our communities. They've been here in our communities. They're going to be here in our communities. And, and I'm sort of of the mindset that why not provide them with some services uh, that, you know, will maybe get them to a point where you can reintegrate them so they're right. not going to reoffend. Yeah. So, you know, I think although there's been some concern about the location of the scene yeah. of the site, I, I, I think facility, people were, were really concerned that we would become uh, the destination for sure. an undesirable population. Yeah, and, and I think that's very understandable, but I think the reality is, and I think we've made it clear with, with probation, and we've made it clear you know, with all the services that, okay, you can have a service center in Vallejo, but you also need to have a service center in Fairfield, and you, and you should have a service center in, you know, in the north part of the county, probably in, in, in Vacaville. Um, you know, so that, yeah, you don't have people from Fairfield or Vacaville or other areas that, you know, would normally report to those areas coming into Vallejo. Right. You know, nobody wants that. Um, and, we, and we're not really seeing that. So, uh, you know, so far I say uh, we're doing okay. You know, the jail population um, is, is holding fairly steady, certainly has increased as a result of, uh, of AB 109. In fact, about a third of the jail population relates to uh, the AB 109ers right now. Um, but, you know, the good thing is we get a statistical report from the Sheriff's Department uh, every month, and we, and we do an analysis of, of that population. We do an analysis of those people that are outstanding, those people that are reporting. When I say outstanding, that they're not complying, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with their probation or the terms of their probation. The Sheriff's Department has a special enforcement team that has been tracking those individuals and, and making compliance checks and whatnot. The Fairfield Police Department just put an officer on that team. And it's my intent when, when we elevate our staffing a little bit to also put an officer on that team so that we can sort of ensure that, that we're getting the services here in Vallejo that, you know, that we truly need. Okay. Now it sounds like um, I, I know you know you were talking about uh, doing things in conjunction with the sheriff mm-hmm. uh, department. Now I know you've done uh, joint operations in the past, right. uh, bringing the sheriff and other agencies in, um, as well as a uh, safe net program that you have going on. So, tell me a little bit about uh, some of the joint operations and also about the the safe net program. Well, the joint operations have involved the sheriff's department, the highway patrol. Um, you know, it's in primarily some targeted enforcement in some particular areas. And uh, it's been very successful, you know, in, in regards to p- providing us with some additional resources to be able to, you know, to go after some of the bad guys and, and whatnot. As far as the Operation SafeNet goes, I mean, this was our attempt to to try to really focus on some of the violent crime and, and you know, and some of the, the increase in, in crime that we saw by getting uh, our officers out in marked vehicles, by having them be visible. I mean, the visibility of our officers in and of itself is a deterrent to crime. Uh, but then if we can focus them in, in some very directed areas, if we have um, so a hot spot area that we think is creeped up because we've had a, you know, a spate of violent crime there or we've had a spate of, of property crimes, then we can focus in on that area. But sort of one of the cool side effects of, of having you know, extra guys out in marked vehicles is that historically our officers in those marked vehicles are on their way to calls. And they're not really stopping and making, you know, enforcement stops or, you know, checking in on suspicious activity and whatnot because they have priority calls to handle. In this case, you have officers in marked vehicles that are doing exactly that, that are making enforcement stops, that are that are directed into particular areas or focused on particular problems and, and whatnot. And the reality is that the bad guys are sort of caught a little bit off guard because they don't know who's going to stop them and who's not going to stop them, you know, or when and under what circumstances. And we're not announcing when we're out there. But the... Uh, handful of operations that we've done so far, four or five, have been wildly successful. I mean, the first one out, we wrote 100 tickets, took 32 people to jail, uh, and that's in one day. That's not even a full day. I mean, that's a half a day. Uh, so, you know, we continue to see success like that where we're making traffic stops, we're taking guns off of people, we're taking drugs off of people, we're getting some of the bad guys off the street, we're taking some of the, the parolees and probationers and we're returning them, you know, to custody uh, because they're out there committing certain violations. And so it's been it's been successful so far and, and we'll do it for as long as we can. Right. Now, my understanding is the, the money for that comes from the fund that is, is not... is 
to hire officers that haven't been hired yet. Right. So you've got you've got some some surplus there for that reason. So um, is to hire more officers. I mean, considering how effective the program is, do you think that that there's going to be a, a way to get funding to continue it going forward? Uh, you know, I, I, it's it's always a balancing act in regards to your overall staffing, your overall allocation of your budget and whatnot. And, and then you take a look at your overtime budget. We always allocate a certain amount of overtime funding for directed patrol, uh, for specific patrol activities, you know, and, and whatnot. So it's a matter of, of, of me as the chief executive officer making a determination in regards to budgeting, particularly for overtime, and making recommendations, recommendations that are either ultimately, you know, accepted or rejected. Um, but I, it's my job to make the argument to say, look, here's what we did, here's how effective it was, here's what I think it might cost going forward. Um, and to get the appropriate allocations and whether I get the allocations from Measure B funds or whether I get them from the general fund, you know, or whatever. But, um, you know, there's always ways to find the funding and the resources. Even, you know, in, in increasing some of our overall staffing numbers, most recently we added uh, in another, uh, another COPS grant. Uh, and and so another cops hiring grant that gave us another million dollars, and the million dollars won't pay for the total cost of the officers, but that's a million dollars that we don't have to pull out of Measure B, or it's a million dollars that we don't have to pull out of the general fund to hire those those police officers and to maintain them out there for at least the first four years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that does give us a little uh, little help. Yeah. Um, community policing. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. I mean, um, I think the previous chief he was he was not a huge fan. Of community policing, at least that was my impression. Maybe yeah, I'm maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Okay. Um, I you know, in fact, I would I would probably say that's that's not even very okay. accurate. Yeah, and the reason being is that this department at one time when we were fully staffed um, had a lot of of um, units, bureaus, divisions, mm -hmm. projects that were related specifically related to community engagement, to community policing, to community oriented policing, problem solving. Um, you know, youth-related, uh, you know, t endeavors, uh, projects that worked on, you know, in engaging the community and, and whatnot. So I think we saw a lot of that, but a lot of that was, was tied very specifically to, to staffing. You know, a lot of people, when they say community policing or, or think community policing, you think, okay, I have to have this little project and I'm going to call it community policing. That's not what community policing is. Okay. Community policing is a philosophy. Uh, and, and the philosophy of community policing is simply a mindset in regards to how you do business. And the way you should do business is by engaging the public the best you can, by, um, by being uh, inclusive of, of providing information to the public, uh, of recognizing that the public is a very strong player in, in, in the triad of policing of, of, of public safety, that you have city government and you have the police and you have the public. And they all play a significant role and they all have a responsibility. The responsibility for, for public safety is not the police department. Uh, you know, certainly we play the largest role in regards to, you know, what we can do and how we can impact, you know, crime in a community, but the public has to pay, play a big role in that regard. And the rest of community government has, you know, or less, the rest of city government has to play, you know, a big role. And so, you know, I think that the previous administration um, tried to do the best they could with the, with the resources mm -hmm. that they had. And, and I think that was evidenced by, by a lot of significant, in, you know, projects. So maybe more, more finance than preference. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay, but uh, what what sort of um, you know? Obviously, it sounds to me like you really embrace that that philosophy. What what sort of um, and and it seems to me like you've taken some real steps in in being more um, responsive to the public, more communicative. Are, are sitting down here, for example. Um, but what what kind of things do you see or do you envision going forward that would sort of follow that that philosophy? What changes? What new things do you do you think you'd like to do? Well, you know, a lot of it relates to community outreach, and a lot of it again relates to staffing and being able to have the you know the appropriate resources. But you know, I think it is a mindset of of uh, you know sort of open and closed, and and sharing of information. And and the reality is is that you know in, in this business for for law enforcement, there are very few secrets. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, the reality is that the only, the only secrets that we have are ongoing criminal investigations and personnel uh, matters. And, and, and by law, we can't discuss personnel matters. And, and we're not going to discuss ongoing criminal investigations because we're not going to jeopardize, you know, investigation. But we are going to share information with the public. And we are going to uh, provide um, all sorts of information regarding what we do, how we do, the way we do it. We want to engage the, the public in, in regards to uh, obtaining input as to what the public would like to see. See, the difference between community policing or, or not engaging, or not sort of embracing that philosophy is that 
historically, law enforcement would drive around, we were the pros, right? And we would go to your neighborhood and we would tell you what your problems were and then we would tell you how to solve your problems and then we'd drive away. And then we would never really survey you and find out if anything worked or we would never really survey you to find out if those really were your problems. And so the philosophy of community policing is to really engage the public in a dialogue to say, what are your public safety concerns? What are your concerns in the community? How would you like us to police you? Um, you know, and so I think you'll be seeing a lot more of that. Um, you know, you know, we had an open house to to sort of show this is who we are and this is what we do. Um, you know, we'll do more meetings uh, to the public. We've done several. In fact, we've done about four or five very recently in regards to uh, neighborhoods and showing up in neighborhoods and. Uh, neighborhood meetings are, are, are a great focus because the reality is that every community is divided into several different areas and several different neighborhoods that are that are very different from one another um, and are very focused on on those neighborhoods and quite frankly a lot of neighbors don't care what's going on in a lot of other neighborhoods they care what's going on in the community overall sure. but they are really focused into their neighborhood and I, and I think that if you truly want to have a community policing philosophy you really have to drill down into the neighborhood level uh, and, and, and really talk to folks at, at, a, at a much uh, more local level, you know, if you will. And, and, you know, I've heard people say, oh, can we have town hall meetings? Can we have this and that? Well, town hall meetings are okay. Um, but, you know, again, you're talking about inviting the entire community in. And I suppose it depends upon the topic or the, you know, the issue of discussion. Uh, but again, most people are they're focused in their area right. where they live and and, and where they so play. So smaller, more work. more targeted meetings probably. And, and and we'll see a lot more of that uh, as we continue that. You know, we we've brought back sort of at least sort of a a portion of our community services uh, by way of bringing back some annuitants uh, who have some expertise in this area. Uh, by way of bringing back or at least hires some part-time folks that could at least focus on some of these areas. Um, I think we need to take control and we have taken control of Neighborhood Watch again. I think part of that... Big expansion of Neighborhood Watch. Big expansion. And part of that was, was advocated to, um, you know, sort of the fighting back group and, and whatnot. And I, I, I sort of understand some of the thinking, you know, as to why that happened. Uh, but that responsibility, crime prevention needs to rely on the police department. Um, and, you know, then going back to the engagement of the community is that very few crimes are solved without the help of the public. And we really need the public to step forward. We really need to help, uh, have them help, be willing to give us information about suspicious activity in their neighborhoods, about suspicious vehicles, about license plates, about individuals, to call us um, you know, in, in a contemporaneous way where, where things are happening, not two days after the fact, but to be able to trust us that you know, we will respond and we will do something about the information that you've given us. Well, what about um, the Citizens Ad Hoc uh, Public Safety Committee? I mean, that was sort of, a, uh, in a sense, some le a level of public engagement. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about what came out of that and what kind of suggestions that maybe have you implemented or found, or found useful or, yeah, not, or not? Well, no, I actually, I think they were quite useful. I, you know, number one, yes, it was a good way to engage the public and it was a good way to engage the community and to, to I think, have a dialogue about public safety when this community needed it. Um, you, you know, and I, and I think that there were there were a lot of significant issues and concerns, and 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 I think it brought some of those things to the forefront. Um, you know, there were a lot of initiatives. There were more than fifty, as I recall, uh, ideas and and um, and thoughts about you know making changes in the organization that were brought forward. Some of them we were already doing them, doing um, some of them. You know, I had already planned on doing uh, some of them. You know, we maybe hadn't really thought of before. Um, and, and I think the reality is, is we've implemented most everything, you know, that, that came out of that, that public safety committee, um, you know, or, or, in, or in the progress of, of, of implementing. A lot of good ideas. Um, you, know, you know, again, we think of ourselves as the pros and we have all the great ideas, right? But that's not true. Um, you know, certainly the, there's a lot of smart people in, in, in every community and the public has some ideas. And, and like I say, I, I think it gave the public uh, an opportunity to say, here's how we would like to be policed, and here's, here's how we would like to see you use your resources, the resources that we, the public, pay for. Okay. Well, let's jump to a completely different subject, cannabis collectives. Okay. That's been a, a kind of an ongoing uh, uh, issue in Vallejo, and it, it, it seems like, in terms of the approach, just my, my perspective is that we sort, of, we sort of approached it in the worst way possible, which was to, like, first ignore the issue, then it got out of control. You're, you're laughing in agreement, I think. Then it got out of control, so there was panic because they were popping up like 
weeds, I yeah. guess we could say. And, and then there were police raids, which the, the result of which hasn't been terribly uh, um, uh, good for the city in court because they've gotten pretty much, I mean, most of the charges have gotten dismissed or thrown out as far as the ones that have gone to, to, to trial so far. Yeah, the, result, so, you know, the results are a mixed bag. Um, let me talk about the results for a second, mm -hmm. and I'll go back to kind of the other issues. But, um, you know, the, the, obviously this is a huge issue that that uh, goes far beyond any police department sure. far beyond any city and whatnot right. I mean today we still have a federal government that says this is illegal right that's in conflict with state government that says that that, that certain aspects of it not all yeah. but certain aspects of it are legal uh, and of course we have the compassionate care act and um, but but I'll tell you this in, in, in my experience and I and I've only been doing this for 35 something years um, in my experience, I've never come across a, a marijuana dispensary or marijuana collective that followed the law, period, uh, that, that followed the state law mm -hmm. okay, in California. And, and there are a lot of guidelines. Some of those guidelines are ambiguous, uh, but there are a lot of guidelines. But I've never seen one that actually followed all the guidelines and all the rules and, and, and all the laws. Okay? Here's, here's sort of a second fact related to a lot of marijuana collectives and, and dispensaries is that many of them, quite frankly, are criminal enterprises. And they are fronts for other criminal enterprises, um, and they are profit-making machines, uh, and and money is laundered and money is funneled, and that's simply a fact. And and the criminal enterprises that this agency went after were just that; they were in fact criminal enterprises. I've seen the cases, I've seen the information. Um, now, with that said, when those uh, dispensaries were raided, as you call it. Um, or, 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 or lawful search warrants were served, um, those search warrants were vetted out through the district attorney's office. They were vetted out through the courts. They were signed by a judge. Uh, and everyone who believed that there was more than probable cause um, to initiate prosecution and criminal action against those particular um, uh, entities. So what happens in the court thereafter is, is sometimes a little bit out of our hands and 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 quite frankly at that point it, the, the sort of the focus shifts over to the district attorney in regards to prosecution right. and and requires you know a successful prosecution now a district attorney in some cases will argue well if we had a better case we could you know do a better prosecution and we might argue well, if we had a better prosecution we'd have a more successful result um, I would argue in this case that if we had a better prosecution we would have had a different result uh, in, in some of these cases but even with that said you can never determine how a judge is going to react in regards to interpreting the law or interpreting a particular case. Would we have liked to have seen a different outcome by way of prosecution in regards to those very specific cases? Yes, we would have. Um, you know, the fact that we didn't, you know, it's kind of one of those things, oh, well. Um, you of know, course, I mean, you know, obviously, I mean, I, I actually sat in on some of the, the court hearings, which is usually Judge Carter, and, um, I mean, it, it It seems, it basically, I mean, you they've pretty much gone nowhere these cases quite frankly mm -hmm. and and uh, it, the conversation he had with the DA was you know I'll paraphrase but it was almost it was comical actually I mean he's a pretty funny guy Carter he is he's got a great sense of humor he's, he should be on TV or something but um, you know he was like uh, Mr. DA uh, are, are we in a, a federal uh, courtroom and the DA said, uh, no are, are we in the uh, county of Solano in the state of California he is like yes your honor well, then it, it, it seems to me that there's not a case here. What would the DA like to do? You know, and that was it. It was, yeah. it was that quick. It was like, bang, the DA is like, and the case dismissed. So that, that's happened repeatedly. I mean, that obviously must be frustrating to you. And, and I mean, the converse is, e even the people that are, maybe not all, but a lot of the people that are in favor of the, the collectives, um, they don't want collectives, or the ones that try or are making an effort to do what they feel is compliant with the compassionate care act they don't want to see these other collectives that are doing illegal things not complying as sure. you say being a front so you know it seems in a sense like it's it's a quandary because if there are those kind of places that are doing that i don't think anyone's going to say oh you know let them let the wild west go and let them do what they want everyone right. says like look if they're not complying with the law for the most part 
they got to go. Sure. Oh no, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I agree with you so, in regards to that. And and you know, sort of going back to where we started this conversation, it did get out of control. There were there were more yeah. than twenty five, you know, thirty right. collectives in in this community. Well, what community needs thirty collectives? No. You know, yeah. No, no community needs that like, many. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, well, I we think became we became a, 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 a start becoming a, a, a marijuana tourism. Uh, well, yeah, literally, um, and 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 you can see that happening in certain yeah. communities, and obviously it happened here. You know, sort of, sort of. Then it sort of goes back to okay. Well, how do you deal with the issue, and how do you deal? Right. How do you deal with the conflict of laws? How do you deal with the difference in state laws? How do you deal with some of these things? Do you tax it? Do you not tax it? Well, obviously, this city, you know, passed a uh, an ordinance that said that they wanted they wanted to tax it. So they, you know, they, they made a very clear statement that they it was okay to be here at some level, mm -hmm. um, and and for what was going to be here. So then it comes down to okay. Well, who, what, when, and where, and and at one level, and and how is it going to be regulated, and and it really drops back to where you've seen some of the some of the case law, some of the recent case law, some of the recent court cases that have dealt with this issue, particularly right. on a or very specifically on a land use issue, and and right. a conditional use issue, and I think that's ultimately what's going to happen with this. In fact. Quite frankly, I, I think that you're going to see marijuana legalized across the United States. It's going to happen, um, you know, and and then and then it's just a determination as to how it's regulated. You know, what we saw in Colorado that okay, you can have you know, if you live there, you can have this much. If you're from out of state, you can have this much. You know, it has to be of this. It has to be of that. And I think that's what you're going to see in California. And that's what you're probably going to see in every state. Ultimately, there's going to be a certain amount of regulation. That regulation is going to pertain to either conditional use or land use or both. It's a zoning issue. Um, you know, not necessarily a law enforcement issue per se, um, and it's going to be regulated. I think in that way, you know, law enforcement may become involved when you know somebody can determine if, in fact, there's a criminal enterprise that's being operated or somebody's operating so far outside the scope of you know what's been determined or what's been accepted for a particular community. So I think that's where we're headed. You know, right, with, with right. the subject. Well, it's a it's a tricky issue. I guess one that we're kind of feeling our way through as the as the legal decisions come and the, right. the sort of jurisprudence gets settled around that. Um, let me see. Uh, moving on to another topic. Okay. The no-tell motel problem. Oh, some yeah. of the crime magnet motels. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I gave a, some coverage to that recently and, and uh, we've written, have put some articles out. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Shussel has. So what are your thoughts about those places in terms of enforcement regulation and, and, and you know, what are you doing or what can be done to Handle well, that problem. I and mean, what we're doing is we, I mean, we have been doing, uh, at least since I've been here anyway, <coughs> an analysis of uh, calls for service in regards to, um, you know, what the issues are, um, how many calls for service we have at different places, and you know, and, and whatnot. It's you know, it, it's sort of an enforcement issue that that sort of falls on the civil side and sort of falls mm -hmm. on the the legal side, you know, through the city attorney's office ultimately to declare, you know, a particular location a nuisance, um, to go after some, you know, location civilly, to try to get it sure, shut down, sure. you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, the good news is that if you look at the Vallejo Inn, for example, well, that was, you know, purchased by the Maritime Academy. Yeah. Um, it's being shut down, uh, and in fact, it's moving into escrow, you know, as we speak. Um, so that's great news. Because, yeah, I mean, absolutely. That was, that, I think, as I recall, that was our number one, you know, yeah. problem area Statistically, by way of... Statistically, yeah. You know, volume and, of calls, yeah. calls for service, and, and so forth. Yeah. So, so that knocks out a huge problem. Now, Anytime you displace crime, it's going to shuffle you, over. You displace it to you know another location. My hope is that you displace it out of Vallejo. Uh, quite frankly, if it goes to Richmond or someplace else, I really don't care, uh, as long as it leaves Vallejo. Uh, but the reality is that a certain percentage of it will stay in Vallejo. So um, you know we'll deal with it, and um, you know we'll try to keep track of those places that are that are creating a nuisance, and try to take some legal action against them when they do. Right, and it seems to me like a, a lot of it is is not like you say not a law enforcement issue, but more of a code enforcement issue and, and, and well, so on. It, it's both. It, yeah. it's, it's law enforcement, it's code enforcement, but it, I mean it has to be compliance because you have to be a responsible business owner. Um, you know, and I've dealt with these places throughout my entire career in, 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 in multiple jurisdictions and, and it's, just, it's just not an uncommon thing. You know, when you have a responsible business owner, rarely do you have the problems. When you have people who are, who are irresponsible or don't want to, you know, comply with the law or comply with, you know, uh, right. you know, being being a good landlord or you know being a good um, yeah or just don't operator. just don't care and want to suck as much money out of the, yeah, the property then, as then possible. Yeah, that's when you tend to have problems, you know, and it becomes a law enforcement you know issue for us when we have the calls or we have the complaints or we have the calls for service and then you know we have to deal with the fallout of that. Right. I mean, just speaking off the cuff, it it, it seems to me that I mean, I wonder if it'd be possible um, to do something that would prevent. Uh, long-term occupancy past a certain point or past an ordinance like that. I don't know if that's even 
they probably have to no, ask no. the lawyers. But yeah, I don't, I, I, you know. I, I don't know that. Yeah, that's probably something we have to take a look or just take a look at. I mean, we're always looking at best practices in other jurisdictions, um, and not only best practices related to ordinances, but best practices related to, to current case law. Because obviously, if we don't fall within current case law. Um, you know, it's not going to work for us. I, I mean, I'll use the example of day laborers. Okay, day laborers, you know, have have, have concerned people in, in communities throughout California, communities throughout the United States for years. Well, the courts have very clearly said it is not unlawful to stand on a street side. It's not unlawful to solicit work uh, in a public place. Um, and yet, you still have people that say, "Why are they there? And why aren't you doing something about it?" Well, they're there because right. it's, it's lawful for them to be there. Sure, sure. You know? And I mean, of course, you know things being what they are in Vallejo, you've got to prioritize and no question you guys have your hands full. Yeah, for sure. So, so Chief, is, uh, is there anything that, uh, that I haven't touched on that, that, that you want to put out there? Any, any question I haven't asked? You know, not that I can think of. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, that, um, you know, clearly where we started this conversation in regards to recruitment and staffing, that's our number one priority and, and we want to do everything that we can to to, uh, to build, rebuild this organization. I mean, if there's a lesson learned from bankruptcy, it's this, it's this, it's this department. Uh, it was cut far too deep, far too deep. Uh, it, it should have never been allowed to happen. I mean, it's, it's not always possible to have a crystal ball and anticipate every retirement, to anticipate every person that's going to leave the organization, to anticipate um, you know, how far you were going to drop. But, but I think a lot of it was, in fact, anticipated, and, and it was ignored for one reason or another. And, and I, you know, I can't tell you who or what or why, um, but I, all I can tell you is it happened. Well, I, yeah, um, I mean, I, I obviously, I mean, I can kind of chime in. I mean, obviously, there was a whole tactical maneuver to separate the different bargaining groups, and, you know, there was a 6.2% sure. raise given to the police, which more or less got taken back right. with the recent cram down. So it was kind of, it was kind of one bad decision after another. Yeah, there were yeah. and there were a lot of bad decisions, and and, and unfortunately, the community, um, I mean, not just the department, but but the community as a whole, is paying for that, uh, yep. and you know, and, and there has been a very negative fallout as as a result of that. Um, you know, to, police matter. Okay, police are important. Uh, everybody, I hope, knows that. Um, you know, I've heard some people say, "Oh, well, you can hire more police officers; not going to make much difference." Bullshit. It's gonna it's gonna make a hell of a difference. And let me tell you how so. When we cut the staffing of this department by 45%, mm -hmm. arrests and bookings decline by 45%. Sure. Do you think that's a coincidence? Of course not. It, yeah. No, it's, yeah. it, 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 it's a fact related to the amount of staffing. But if you have fewer police officers, that's right. going to translate to fewer arrests. Right, and it seems obvious, I mean, that we've, we've kind of, of, of passed the, the threshold of what, you know, makes sense for a city this size. Oh, absolutely. Any absolutely. metric. There's any metric, and you know, the, because the reality is there is no model for this. There's no model right. for this anywhere right. in the state of California. I mean, I almost, I almost have to smile a little bit, you know, when I, when I listen to, mm -hmm. you know, people talking about the Oakland Police Department. When I listen to people talking about the Stockton Police Department, mm -hmm. you know, Stockton is, is in a very similar situation, you know, that we faced five, six, seven years ago. Now, right. that's, it's unfortunate, but it, but it's kind of reality. But I say I almost have to smile because I hear about the Oakland Police Department saying how horribly understaffed they are with 650 police officers for a population of 400 or 450,000. Okay, I get that. You're understaffed. But your per capita staffing is still well over one. Okay? Right. When you look at Stockton, they have 350 police officers for 300,000 people. Your per capita is still above one. You know, when you drop when you drop down to about 0.75, come cry on my shoulder. Because that's the situation that we face here today. Um, you know, so it, it is very difficult to deal with. And, and I think, I guess just the thing I'll close with is that we have extraordinary staff, um, sworn and non-sworn. And, and, and I'll tell you what, they're doing extraordinary things with the resources that they have and giving the amount of officers that they have. I mean, there's a very fine line between chaos and what these folks are doing out there every day. And, they, and, they're, and they're keeping things in check and, and they're doing an amazing job. Um, and I'm not quite sure how they do it every day, but I'm glad that they do. Okay. Well, Chief, thanks for sitting with me. It's been a privilege okay. and a pleasure and, and sharing your thoughts. And, You're welcome. Uh, thank you for all the work you do. All right. Well, thank you.